Welcome to today's Google Hangout. We got a great guest. Nick's here to talk about his article about being small. Of course, we have the boss here, Bobby Halton, and special guest host, uh, Sam Villani, who's been an acting battalion chief in Montgomery County, Maryland. So we'll talk to him a little bit about his experiences and being acting and making that a success. Um, I've always been taught that if there's an elephant in the room, you should introduce it. So <laughs> I want to just briefly talk a little bit about what's going on with the IFF right now. Now, I invited and PJ Norwood invited Harold Shatesberger, the general president, on this show in the radio show. And if Harold does decide to come on, he will have a fair hearing. I believe, as Fire Engineering believes, in due process and hearing all sides of an argument. I remember back during the Ritchie case in the Supreme Court case, Fire Engineering published a commentary on from the Black Firefighters Association, a threat to national security. And then I published my reply to their piece. But I think it goes back and I, I think, I don't wanna ever speak for Bobby Halton, but I think we're on the same page as this one with our old friend, Benjamin Franklin. And I'm just gonna read this real quick because I think it's important and it's important for firefighters to realize that we can agree to disagree on things and there are two sides, but this is Benjamin Franklin's apology for printers. This appeared in the Pennsylvania Gazette in 1731 and it said, printers are educated in the belief that when men differ in opinion, both sides ought equally to have the advantage of being heard by the public. And that when truth and era have fair play, the former is always an overmatch for the later. So to put it in a modern speech, not less, Bobby, can you weigh in on that? And I'm sorry if I kind of spoke for you, but I, I think we're of the same, same uh, mindset on this one. No, and, and also, Ben Franklin once said that if a publisher didn't publish anything that wasn't, uh, that someone didn't find offensive, they would never publish anything at all. <laughs> so, you know, you're always going to have somebody that disagrees with you. It's just fine. It's human nature. Um, I, I think what's very important, though, in, in this particular instance, and, and remember, fire engineering was uh, established that, I hate to take up your time, Sam and Nick, we'll get, we'll, we'll, we'll catch up really fast here. But um Fire engineering was established in 1877, devoted to the interests of the firemen of the nation. That was the language they used. Today, it's the firefighters of the nation. And predominantly, we serve the United States of America. We're, we're, we're read somewhat internationally, but not extensively internationally. I think Canada is very similar to us in their modalities um, and, and, and some other countries that have an interest in American tactics. But primarily, we're, we're interested in what's going on in the United States of America, which is, which is more than enough than you can say grace over. You know, if you want to have stuff to write about, there's plenty going on. And so to that point, you know, we're, we're certainly interested in what's going on with the union and, and because it, it, it counts for about 300,000 uh, of, of America's firefighters with 1.8 or 1.5 million firefighters out there. So that's not an insignificant number of people. To that point, Harold Shakespeare is one of my oldest friends, and, and I hold him extremely high in, in my esteem of him and, 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 and as, a, as a personal acquaintance, as is Eddie Kelly, one of my dearest friends. They're wonderful people. So all of that notwithstanding, they both deserve to have a fair hearing and a platform and an opportunity to discuss whatever it is they feel that they need to speak about. That is irrespective of how you feel about it emotionally. Today, it's all about feelings. This is, this is not about feelings. This is about uh, issues that Eddie raised in, in, in regards to uh, the management and operations of our union. So, um, and, and Harold has answered that and, and the board is dealing with it and, and continuing to deal with it. And now there's an FBI investigation uh, going into it. So, which may be the reason why Harold can't uh, respond, uh, Frank, is that he may be precluded because anything that he does say, if he's under investigation, could be, you know, weaponized against him. Because, you know, people take a word and, 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 and lots of times people do things which in hindsight turn out to be questionable, which they had no ill motive whatsoever when they did it. In other words, 
We ascribe motive after the fact as if people knew at the time when they were doing something that it was going to have unintended. Take Christopher Columbus, for example. He was looking for a route to India. He was not trying to destroy the Native American population in the Americas. See, that was not his intent. He was trying to find spices in India, ergo the term Indians. He was not, you know, trying to hurt anybody. But now people ascribe motive to him as if he was some kind of, you know, unscrupulous villain. And, and I don't know much about, Frank's an Italian, he can tell you more about Columbus. I'm an Irish guy, I'm, I'm hung up on St. Patrick. So, um, and Cromwell, who was a terrible person. Anyway, um, but I digress. To, to, to my point, uh, Harold, Eddie, any member of the IAFF, any member of, any firefighter at any time can access the fire engineering platform and, and can speak on this platform about politics with Frank and PJ, or they can, you know, write and we'll publish, you know, unedited what it is they have to say. We're, 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 and, and Harold knows at any time he can access this platform in any format he wants, as can Eddie, as can, you know, uh, Pat Morrison or any of the other senior leadership of the IAFF. And, and, and we, we really like those guys. So it looks like Frank's having a little trouble. So we're gonna continue along because it's, it's not easy being small. And I live in a community that has a small volunteer fire department and then a relatively small career fire department that abuts us. Um, I believe about 100, 100 plus or so members of the Owasso Fire Department. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how many active volunteers we have currently in Limestone Fire Protection District number two. Um, so, and I do work with both those organizations, just hanging out, you know, going to training stuff with them kind of being old and in the way, refusing to give up, right? <laughs> refusing, uh, what was it that, uh, um, it was MacArthur, right? Who said, old soldiers never die, they just fade away. Same thing with old firefighters never die, we just fade away, you know, we just, we show up less and less and, and whatnot. So Nick, you, uh, you wrote a great piece. I thought it was a great piece. It's not easy being small. And, and uh, if you haven't had a chance to read it, the audience, could you just kind of go over you, know, you spoke about your organization and a fire you had and a question your chief threw out there and how you created some systems and, and you talk about, you know, calling for mutual aid and, and risk assessment, and all that. So why don't you run us all through and then Sam can join in. I know Sam uh, has some really good perspective on it because of where he is surrounded by all a myriad of organizations. Um, so why don't you get us up to speed on the article and your thoughts behind it? Well, th thanks, Bobby. It's truly a pleasure to be here. I appreciate it. So, you know, it's funny, you just said a small department with 100 guys. In, in my world, that's, that's almost, a, in Connecticut, that's almost a metro. It, it, you know, we have four or five metros in the state. My, my version of small, where it really gets hard, is what I grew up in. So I got in the fire service in 76, got a job in 79, spent uh, a long time one place, got recruited to come back home, and then I've been chiefing for a while. I just retired in 18. So for me, small means if you can't put 10 to 15 people on the fire ground that are interior qualified, that are certified, that's small. I've worked, I get to travel around uh, with my part-time job. I've seen companies where there were seven people in the company and the seven people in the company were trying to actually run a, a hose wagon, two, two ambulances and a brush truck. It was just crazy. I've seen, you know, so it really depends on where you live and who you're next to. You know, if you're from, uh, if your next door neighbor has five, six, seven, eight people on duty, they may be the big dog in the neighborhood. You know, and, and while you, you know, it's hard to get our heads around because, you know, we have like 20 things we need, you know, we actually have like 18 to 20 people's worth of work to do them ultimately safely. You know, small departments don't have that option. Uh, you know, the example I gave in the, in, the, uh, in the article was, let's just take a ground letter. You know, two people, so you, the old rule was first number is how many people you need, right? 24 foot ground letter, not in the small world. In the small world, that's one guy. As a matter of fact, I saw on one of the, on, on one of the YouTubes, I actually saw a department teaching their people how to carry a 35 by themselves. But it's not, a, yeah, just crazy. So you know, a, young, I mean, a young lady who teaches for us um, at FDIC um, taught me how to throw a 35. I had never been taught how to throw a 35, but you can do it safely. It, it's, it's ugly. Yeah, and it, that's, it's that ugly. Me. But with the right technique, it takes time, 
and, and she didn't let me do it quickly. She, she could do it pretty quickly, but she was, she was much healthier than I am. She was a, she, she's a, and she's tiny too. She's a, a small gal, but she could throw it very adeptly. I struggled with it, but she did show me how to do it. So sorry, Nick, to interrupt. No, no, but that's the point. That, that, that's, that's the second part of this is you can't be fooling around when you're small. You, you have to, so let's just take, you're, you're gonna, you can literally, and I saw that LA does this as a drill for their recruits. You can take a 24, put it on the ground, put the roof ladder, hook it in, put your tool on it and get your chainsaw and you can drag that to the front of the building and then flip it, everything falls off. Then the 24 goes up, you set the ladder, the roof ladder up, you grab your stuff, swing the saw and you're up by yourself on the roof. That's a small, that's a small department thing. Is it a safe thing? Is it the safest thing? No, it's the same thing. If you've got to do a three-story stretch, you may have two guys. That's we'll it. Do that in my building. department, huh? That, that that exact thing we do in our department. We have our our truck companies are three three person staffing. So, the either the third or the tiller the tiller person and the uh, officer go in, and the driver will do exactly that. If they got to get get around to the rear of a garden apartment, right. they're, they're putting a twenty eight or a thirty five down. <laughs> loading it up and dragging it, dragging it around back. And, you know, the spurs on, on ground ladders, you can replace They're they're, you know, they're easy to it, replace. So. And does it, and that's the point I made in the article. If you got to go, you got to go. If you see a, a brother or a sister hanging out the window, or if you see a victim at the window and you're it and you're the outside guy, you, you got to do something. You, you, you get now, you, you might have the option. A lot of our guys, uh, if they were on the, on the ladder, they would also be going in with, the, with that first line but they'll set the truck before they go because they just know that someone, not them, but a, a callback guy is going to eventually inherit that ladder. Right. And then, and then take the rest of it, but they might go to the roof of the ladder rather than use a ground ladder if they could. So whether it's uh, stretching a hand line, I mean, you might have two guys on an inch and three quarter doing a three story stretch. It is what it is. And, you know, once you get there, because, you need to do what you have to do to get that stuff. The other thing that's a hiccup is when you're doing that, you got two or three people, let's say it's a good day and you got three people on that first line and you bump, you find a victim because we're doing searches and extinguishing at the same time. We, we don't have search teams on that initial line. Our whole mission in life is to get one line on the fire. You put the fire out, things get better. That's, that's the mission. So literally maybe everybody who's not tied down is on that one line to get to the seat of the fire. You find the victim. Well, that's what just stopped. The stretch just stopped. And now we got to back out because either we have to both carry that person or even if we have the third guy or gal, they may be carrying the victim and you're protecting them from what's coming over their heads. Right? So now that, so now your extinguishment stops and now the clock's ticking. And you got to get them outside. You may be able to drop them off to somebody else or not. And then you got to get back in and get the game back on or someone else has to. And that's where we built the systems that Bobby talked about. Um, you know, you have to have these heart to heart conversations with these other leaders and you have to really say, and I used to have these very privately, not in front of the whole group. Listen, I need your group to do blah, 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 whatever it is, whether it's stretching the roof above, floor above, whatever it is. Can you, can you do that at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday? Because it doesn't matter what you do training night. Training night, you had an hour before class to remind everybody to come. You got guys that don't ever come to calls, but they'll come for the points. That, that's not realistic. 10 o'clock on a Tuesday, who's coming? What are they bringing? What skills are they bringing? So you have to build the system where they're, you're able to count on your mutual aid partners to, to do that. We were very lucky. We, we had uh, 10 different departments in our town, all different little subdivisions, but we had a great organization, chief's organization. We had one ICS system. We had one Mayday system. We had one FAST system. We had the same specifications for gear. The only difference was the colors. And so that when we could actually build an alarm that worked throughout that whole district. And so for us, that's how we built the system. And, and they knew what, everybody had the same expectations as to what jobs were gonna happen at the same time. But 
we also had some conversations with folks and they, if they kept saying, no, they can't do this, they can't do that, then you know what? We look for something they can do. If all you can do is get two guys out on 10 o'clock on a Tuesday, I've got a sprinkler riser for you. Absolutely. I, I've got a job for you to do that. I've got utilities for you to do. I've got, a, you know, whatever. You may be laying the line and that's it. That may be your contribution to that event because you, you don't have anybody to go inside. You know what I mean? I didn't mean to monopolize the conversation, but I'm sure you see the same thing down, down south. No, and I, and I would say that it's very important that folks read your piece because it's a very well-written piece. And you raise a lot of really important questions inside that piece, like how, and, and I, I know Sam can speak this very well, because I know that the county does a great job of this where you live. What, what are the risks within your first due, right? So when we're talking about the really small departments, their first due is their whole community, really. Exactly. That's their first due. And so they've got to understand all of those risks. And some of them can be, you know, wickedly complex. I mean, uh, my small volunteer fire department has some um, automotive uh, places in there that are, um, shall I say, um, dealing with extremely expensive and valuable cars. And, and so the protection of that facility, that, that facility is worth millions, tens of millions. And, and um, so, so it's a big deal to the, to the community because it's a really important piece of the community. And then, and then there are just a, a plethora of lovely homes and, and a mixture of mobile homes and everything in between that you can imagine. And, and so understanding that as Sam uh, and Nick pointed out is huge uh, in terms of uh, assessment. And, and I loved your piece because the one thing about your piece is Pete Prokilo, who's our web editor, was able to list about 5,000 articles that relate to it. I mean, it was like, it was like the, it was a smorgasbord of now you better read this. Now you better read that. Now you better read this. It, a lot of, by the way, is that where you keep your girl in that fancy house? Or you keep that, you keep your car in your house. What do you do? I, I, I well, I, I keep some of them here at the house. I keep some of them there. I, I, I really scaled back because I, uh, physically I can't do much anymore. Um, I can't wrench much anymore. I just so, can't. But to your point is a lot of places don't do community risk assessments. And in, in my part-time world, that, that is the first thing I hit the street. Matter of fact, before I arrive in the community, um, in the state infra system, I'm on, on, I got the census information, I got all that data. And then I'm literally Googling, driving around through the community, just looking uh, to see what's there. That, that sounds this, that's a... I did one, we did one project where they had seven plants that made, that made explosives in this one community, seven. Now the good news, bad news is when, by the time they would get there response time wise, there wouldn't be a whole lot to do other than put out the forest, but potentially, but you know, people take advantage of, of those situations sometimes because they don't want to be in the limelight. They don't want to be downtown. They don't want to be in a, a community where there's going to be a lot of poking and prodding, so they'll they'll put this they'll put these out in the, in the rural communities. And it's, wow, how how long were you assigned in Afghanistan? <laughs> no, 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 I I'm too old for that. So Sam, no, I'm that. Sam, I'm sorry. No, I just want to bring Sam in on your community risk reduction point, and also Frank. I wanted to, Frank, when you get back in here, and if you're if you're stabilized finally, I'd love to hear about Nick's idea about. Uh, you know, crew assignments that 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 expand beyond one organization, which I thought was really uh, brilliantly done. And and also, you you talked about uh, Nick and John down uh, in Phoenix at the Blue Card, and when mm -hmm. we we're trying to plug in, and I remember the dilemma because Alan and I, I've been doing assessment seminars for years and years, and Alan and I always struggled with assessments and training because that. It's so artificial. You know, you, you tell guys, okay, we want you to take the door, you know, or we're going to take the door. And in an assessment center, it's like, okay, now it's done or, or in a simulation. And the reality is, you know, if it's a, if it's a center locking armor door, you could be there five, 10 minutes. You know what I mean? Which is a, on the fire ground, it, it, it's like doggy years, right? You've, you, <laughs> you, you celebrated two birthdays, you've gone through three wives or, or husbands, you know what I mean? And, and, and you're like, you guys have that door yet? Your gals have that door yet? You know what I mean? 
So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's that, it's that how you do that. Right. And I think the dilemma for the blue card folks, as they tried to go out nationally, and, and I'm not speaking for Nick and John, I, who I, I love dearly, but um, you know, how do you come up with a, to Nick's point, not every department can take a roof in, you know, three minutes or five minutes or 10 minutes. No, you know, it, it, it's going to vary depending on how many folks you have and what they know. So, so Sam, I didn't mean to jump in there, but. No, I mean, so it, it's kind of speaking to that, you know, I'm in this temp gig I'm, I'm in where I'm uh, an acting battalion chief. I had a, a, I've had two significant fires. Both of that right after action reports on the second one. So, you know, we have an incident response policy, which is um, similar to, to an SOP or an SOG that's kind of spells things out. Right. So I got there and I had, I had a, a rapidly extending fire on the outside that got into the attic. So I really needed to split the first and second due engines. I needed to split the responsibility when our, our incident response policy says, you know, the second due engine is going to a ensure the first lines in service and then B they're going to stretch a backup line. And uh, so it was one of those things. It was like the second major fire I had been in charge of. And I, I had to I had to make the decision to do it. It's it's one of those things. I wasn't going to let the um, the IRP drive the incident when I knew the best action was to split those to split the first two companies, have the uh, the first company hit the exterior fire, and the uh, second company stretch in and, and start opening the attic up. And it worked. We saved the uh, the first floor and the basement, and even below like the four foot mark on the second floor, everything was um, other than the water and smoke damage was salvageable. So. Um, like furniture and that kind of stuff. So it, 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 it worked well. I had, you know, I had to justify it, but it's one of those things that any, any action we do in the fire service, right. It has to be uh, uh, justifiable and defendable. All right. But, uh, Sam, so Sam, let me, let me tell you my world. So I, again, you need to, you need to really engineer the bejeebies like the Martian movie. You got to engineer the bejeebies out of this thing, right? Here's my world. Same exact fire. Same exact fire. Back porches are going, bottom to top. One guy arrives by himself. This is before we went, we upgrade. One guy arrives by himself. Pulls up, pulls the blitz fire, gets down, on, goes laterally on the fire. He gets the blitz, goes back, he's by himself. Now, now a volunteer arrives, he puts the volunteer on the blitz fire, he goes back and he charges off of tank water. So we got two things. We got an aggressive offensive tool that can provide adequate water for the fire hazard. And the tank on the truck is designed big enough that there's going to give us an extra couple minutes. Now the rest of the cavalry arrives. And, and in the article, we talk about backup teams. So the, uh, the rest of the force from my department arrives, plus my backup teams arrive. They take the second line right through the front door and they stop it in the back room. Beautiful. Different world. <laughs> no, so so we had one guy on the so we had the pump operator. He does the initial attack. Again, thinking thinking small. He gets one guy to work that machine to get work that nozzle. Two more guys show up, or actually, we turned into about three or four at that point. They went right through the front door. Water supply was part of that deal, and they held it. They held it right there. And so that's again, awesome. just that's our world. That's our world is sometimes you have to buy me. And again, the, not to brag about that. Let's just call it some part of lightweight portable monitor, you know, on a, we, and where do we get that from? It's okay. We got that from a rural. That's a great company. They all, everybody makes great monitors. If that's what the guys are using, you don't have to right? worry about that. But so. we got, we got that from a rural company up the street, up the river. Cause they would burn up a bunch of barns and they said, you know what? We're going to buy that lightweight hose. We're going to put this on the end of it. We're going to use three inch lightweight hose. We're going to put this in here. And I get about 500 gallons a minute out of that. And we said, well, we've got a lot of these situations where we have that flank. Let's do it. Let's do that. You know, let's do that. And now we call that probably would call that transitional, but back then we called it put out the damn fire. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Let's, let's, let's darken the whole back of the house down. Fastest water approach. And, and to Nick and Sam's point, just to, I want to get Frank in here too. Sorry, I didn't mean to take over your show, Frank. I was just we're just having fun. It's, it's all your show. Show. We've, oh, we've dropped all yeah. the politics crap. Awesome. We're going straight to tactics. But uh, 
which is interesting because the politics of a community define the tactics. <laughs> people don't have the money, yeah. and in a lot of places, just don't have the money. They, we'll talk they about just that. Flat out, don't have it. You know what yeah. I mean? It's not that they don't want to pay their tax. They don't have it. Yeah. So, I, I think what's interesting is that we've been throwing water through windows and doors and For off years. the floor. since the since 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 Ben Franklin put us, you know, put put the system together here. I mean, it's not, I mean, the transitional language and, and the studies, we're just looking at stuff we've been doing forever. I mean, you know, really, I mean, I remember when I first came on, occasionally you'd go up the front door of a place and the boss would say, hey, darken that down, give it a splash. Or, or, the, or, the, or the crews, would, you know, the, uh, somebody hit it, from, hit it from the ground. Chicago's been doing that in the high rise side since, since backdraft, you know, and before. So, you know, it, it, and the, the taste late, great, less filling stuff just drives me crazy. But Frank, what are your thoughts? Well, one of the things that I'd like to bring up is that the fire service always tends to focus on the fire. And one of the problems across the country that we tend to be a little lacking on is the planning. Now, exactly. Nick, you talked about having everybody from mutual aid being on the same radio channel and understanding the game plan. That's great. But I think we need to, especially when it comes to volunteers around the country, is we need to look at ways to better front load the problem. And it takes a little planning. And I just want to give you just two quick examples. So Rockville, Maryland, I was a live-in. You know, there was a time where in Rockville, the volunteers had trouble getting out just because of life and things going on. So they knew that they either had to change or die. So they came up with the live-in program. So they provided room and board for college students to help with their staffing. Then they established duty nights because it was tough with school sports. I mean, when I was a kid, you played one practice and one game a week. Now when kids play sports, when COVID's <laughs> over, they're playing five, six nights a week. Yep. So they came up with duty nights as volunteers. So in, they were supplemented by the live-ins and the paid personnel. But instead of having a volunteer that was responsible to go in every single day of the week for every call, they basically kind of said, hey, Tuesday night is your crew. You're going to eat, train with that Tuesday night crew. And then in the morning, you're gone and the next crew comes in. So they found ways to change. Uh, Mineola, New York um, had problems getting volunteers out for uh, alarm bells at night. So even though they were still responding from home, they came up with a plan and they said, okay, we're going to assign only three people a night right. that would have to get up to, from their house to go in for alarm bell calls so that it wasn't taxing the entire system. So it takes a little upfront planning, but I think that we owe it to the public we serve and the firefighters to try to think a little out of the box to figure something out. I mean, even in communities that don't have... Um, colleges. How often do we have a man or a woman who gets divorced and needs a place to stay? You know, <laughs> hey, they're in the firehouse. The town I live in, Wallingford, had a proud volunteer tradition. And I gave them the live-in kind of idea from what I got from Rockville. They didn't want to hear it. Well, two of their volunteer companies now out of the fort are closed. Yeah. So sometimes you got to change and you got to figure out to keep what's going on great. Bobby? Well, I think and Nick, Nick pointed out some really neat ideas inside that article. And again, I hate to harp on it so much, but I hope people listening to this go, you know, go look at it. It's an incredibly, incredibly deep piece. I mean, uh, you know, I, I think that Nick probably could have, I think there's eight or 10 other articles inside of that thing, Nick, really. I mean, you could take each point. Right? Don't you feel the same way, Sam? I mean, when I was reading yeah. that thing, I, I kept thinking, okay, man, Nick could have, you could pull out like two or three paragraphs when Nick hits the topic. So one of the topics Nick talks about is the whole idea of calling in mutual aid, assistance, help, right? And, and a comment was made to him that his city manager or whatever said, we ought to call it immediately, just based on what was going on in your community, which is okay. He wasn't being pejorative. He wasn't being mean. He wasn't questioning anybody's, you know, virility or capability or anything else. He was just saying, hey, here's the reality. You know, we need more folks. Honest to God, that's what the whole blue card thing was created from. That the blue card idea, when I first presented it years ago to Alan, grew out of a wildland fire we had in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and and we had we were we were able to put 
600 people on the ground at the same time for, uh, I don't know, about 72 hours, maybe longer, close to 80 some odd hours, nonstop, over 600 people, continuous. And, and, but we wasted everybody. So we came up with this idea that for career jobs, like, like, like Albuquerque, like smaller, the metros you described, Nick, we, the whole idea behind Blue Card was not, it, it, and you needed a curriculum, and Nick and John gave us that, that which is great, and they've done a beautiful job. But what, you, what, what the next part of it that I, I had always hoped for was that Bipperville and Bopperville, if they all train the same and have the same terminology and understand each other's equipment, the off-duty roster should be available to both of them or, or, or all of them in that area to call people back to come to work and pay them if necessary to help them take care of events. Not, not necessarily bring the apparatus, but just have access to Bipperville and Bopperville and Kipperville and Copperville to quote Mike Mulligan and Mary Ann from, remember Mike Mulligan and Mary Ann, the steam shovel? The, 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 remember the children's book? One of my favorite books of all time. But um, anyway, so no, really. It was a great book because Mike Mulligan bet that Mary Ann could dig as much uh, um, dirt in one day as 100 men could. And then along came these diesel steam shovels. And it's a great book. You got go, go Google Mike Mulligan and Mary Ann. And, and, and it's a wonderful book. Anyway, um, so the idea was numbers, just sheer numbers. And it didn't matter. If, if somebody showed up wearing Montgomery County and it didn't matter if somebody showed up right. with Simsbury or Albuquerque, it, it didn't matter. It mattered that they understood the system and could plug into the system. You know? I, let me, let me add a couple of things, Bobby. Cause it, so um, mutual aid, everybody was fine with calling mutual aid. Once you got there and saw that you really needed them. And that was, that was our, that was our weakness. Now we're very close, our, our neighbors are very close to us. So we had some relatively good response times, but not good enough. So it was, the, it was actually the chairman of the safety committee. We we're in a meeting and we used to have a very robust volunteer company. Matter of fact, the, the firefighters weren't called firefighters, they were called drivers because they never had to do anything other than pump and drive. So, but anyway, that dwindles and dwindles. Now he had the audacity to say, we got to call for help before we get there. And, and, and that, that was really, uh, that really shook us up. So a couple things, uh, let me talk about one problem I see across the country. There's mutual aid and there's mutual abuse. So, you know, being willing to go to your neighbor and help them out when they need help is a great thing. Going over to your neighbor when they can't do their workload and taking care of their business, that goes for a little while until you hit a trigger point. And, and the trigger points I mentioned are, uh, you're there before they are, uh, you show up and they don't show up, you're in their district, let's say it's a specialized piece, a ladder, a tank, or a rescue, whatever. You're in their district with a tanker more than you use the tanker in your district. Uh, someone on some council, not the receivers, <laughs> but the givers are going to say, why is my tanker over in, you know, in, in Hooterville more than it is used here? Why did we buy this so you could send it over there all the time? And that'll, that'll cause enough friction to have a conversation. Sometimes it's just a contract, it's a mutual aid agreement, or whatever it may be. But sometimes it's like, and I've seen this, we actually got called in on a, on a project where the, where the elected official says, you can't go there anymore with this piece of apparatus. It's costing us too much and we're not getting anything back. And that was, the, that was the point of blue card, Nick, in a way. Sometimes you just need the people. You don't need them to drive their apparatus or strip their right. community. You just need whoever else is not engaged at the time. And one of the things that's, that I know from being a, you know, associated with my volunteer friends out here, it's very rare in, in this part of where I live for two events, fire events, to be happening simultaneously. Very rare. EMS, different story. But fire, very rare. And we can run those. I mean, you know, we do a lot with Excel. We can run those numbers and give you percentages. Right. The second thing, but so let's go to the, and we used, we being this close to New York City, we use the, we ended up developing the second source. So if, if we get a straight box or whatever comes in, just the on duty crew went or just the, our firefighters went. However, second call, uh, we still have municipal boxes. A municipal box comes in with it. Uh, the lady calls back and says, now it's eating the cabinets in the kitchen. 
a cop pulls up and there's smoke showing, that trips additional resources. And then in the article, it talks about over time, it started out, we were very lucky. We had two stations with an industrial department right in the middle who wanted to get out, really wanted to get out, and we wanted to have them because they were very well trained. So we went to a plus, they came with us, and this was for two in, two out. Their whole job, their whole job when, when this first started was to find the line and find the butt. Find the line and find the person in front of them, keep their eyes on them, because we needed to do that. And then over time, it, we built it to the plus, where we started really doing a good risk assessment right down to fire flows, size of the building, hazards to get there. And that's when we added that other piece where we said, listen, we actually need an additional engine and truck here, or we need an additional engine here. But again, not on every, not on every call, but if it tripped that wire, if it tripped the second, you know, there's a second source, then we would, we would send those resources. Sam, do you do anything like that up down south where, how does that Down south. Out? He's talking to a guy in Montgomery County, down <laughs> south. I got buddies in Alabama yeah. right now who want to kick your ass. <laughs> That's the south, brother. He's, 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 he's a northerner. He's a, he's a, he's a tried and true northerner, man. I saw <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, our, down our south. Education center. I know, right? He's, Nick's the kind of guy who says All he's going out. He's, I, 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 I'm going to go out. I'm going to go. I'm going to go out west for for a vacation. I'm going to Jersey. <laughs> going to Although the way the weather's been these days, it feels like we're we're da- we're down south for sure. But um, now our, our our communication center has the latitude to dispatch. Uh, we have a, a rapid intervention dispatch that brings us. Um, it, it it basically builds out the rapid intervention uh, group on the scene, but we can use those folks for other things. And um, again. Uh, my most recent significant fire. Once the fire was docked, it was a it was a summer day. It was July second, and um, we ended up rotating some of the rapid intervention crews in to do to to mop up. Right, so uh, I called for additional resources, but they were coming from a, 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 a distance away. Uh, we were able to engage those crews that were already on the scene. So yeah, our our, our communication center has the latitude to add extra resources. Uh, to an incident based on what they're hearing. And, and a lot of times it is, um, you know, the police, the police are everywhere. It seems like they get on the scene, even for working codes with us, the police have like a, you know, like a box tone in, in, uh, in our, in our, our, in our county. And uh, for, you'll hear it for working codes. We listen as, as battalion chiefs, we listen to the police radio because they, they stumble upon so much stuff and it, and it gives us a lead time to kind of, you know, get the game plan in motion, but you'll hear the, the, their, the, the, we call, I call it the cop box. You'll hear the cop box go for a working code. And those guys, they're driving like maniacs to get to this working code, but they have AEDs and they know how to do CPR. And, right. and they've actually, uh, they've, they've, they've affected <laughs> a number of saves, you know, just that, that forward thinking of, of the, uh, of the police to get in there and do that. But anyway, yeah. So we have that, the, uh, th- again, our, you know, our communication center being a, a forward thinking entity of our department, um, they have the latitude to add those extra resources. Yeah. One thing that needs to be considered um, to go back to what Bobby was saying about personnel, and this goes for career departments and volunteer, whether you're small or not. Remember, accountability is still the key to safety on the fire ground. So there are going to be times, even in a city, where they're going to put somebody else to work who's not there. It could be somebody from an off shift, but you got to remember that that's got to go through command. And even if you're on yeah. the rear of the building, and you got to get your radio and say, I have firefighters so-and-so with us helping us put up a ladder. That way they're accounted for. You would think that accountability isn't an issue anymore, but Connecticut, and Nick's from Connecticut too. I, I've never met him before, but you know, we go back to the Eddie Ramos fire in Brantford. Yeah. Um, if I remember the story correctly, um, no one knew that Eddie Ramos was no, he left. Seen until the next morning when they saw his car there after uh, the building no already collapsed. So you can't just put people to work. It, it's dangerous. It's got to go through command. And that doesn't mean, especially in a volunteer department, it doesn't mean that they have to go to the command post and tag in, depending on what your system is. But as soon as somebody sees this person in there, uh, in some authority, you're going to put this person to work and le- pick up the radio and say to command, I have this person with, with me. Yeah. Now I'm going to account for that person. Uh, Sam, uh, you're now that you're an acting battalion chief, 
I'm sure you've experienced on these last two fires, even when it's all set up, not what even Nick said dealing with, but even when it's all set up for experienced fire ground officers, it's difficult tracking dynamic crews. You know who's there, but do you know what they're doing? Can, can you speak a little to that? Because I'm, I'm sure that goes through your mind. Well, yeah, I mean, I've even had, so, you know, we have, it's talking about like the industrial fire department that you had running with you up, up there, um, Nick. We have uh, federal fire departments in our in our jurisdiction that we run with, and um, they have they have chief officers, they have roster chief officers. So, I've had uh, on one incident, um, <laughs> we're we're in the middle of this thing that you know the fire is being knocked, and uh, I hear that uh, a, a chief officer from the federal company pipe up, and he's in he's on the second floor, um, and <laughs> I I had no interaction with, him. I didn't even know he's on the scene. You know, so it's one of those things. As soon as you identify it, of course, I made him the, you know, the division super division two supervisor and put him, you know, in an official capacity. But yeah, you from time to time, even when you, you know, you have, you know, who your units are, you're tracking your units. We, we, we do charting. You know, we have a, a tactical worksheet that we chart on and we, you know, we write the units down. And as we assign the units in the divisions or groups, you know, we cross them out on the resource side so we know exactly where they are. Um, and, and know, know what our capacity is there, uh, for, you know, for the rest of the incident. But even then, sometimes you, you assign somebody to a certain air, uh, area or task and they get there and they, as they're going there, they come across something, right? So, yeah, and, and sometimes that always isn't uh, readily communicated either. You'll, you'll call for division two and they'll say, oh, we're up here on the uh, third floor doing uh, such and such. And you're like, oh. but, you know, <laughs> And then that, that's when you have to, okay, are they, are they, they're not freelancing. They just, they just came across this other issue in their assigned area. And you, and you got to, uh, you have to, you have to, you have to get your hands around it. Right. So to, to Frank's in point though, to Nick, in, in your department, your crews are even more do- dynamic than we would find in a city or a county situation where people are pretty much assigned to task because they're going to be moving around because there's less of them. So how do you keep the accountability in uh, in that situation? So are you asking me? Yes, sir. Because I'm a jerk. I, I, I'm, I'm pretty straightforward. I am, I am, I'm a, a big jerk when it comes to accountability. Started a long time ago with, uh, we had the, the term that some of my guys use were gypsies. I call them freelancers where they would just drift in, create a lot of havoc, break a lot of stuff, and then drift out, and they wouldn't even stay to pick up the hose. So we had to, we had to lock this down. And if you're in my neighborhood or in my sphere of influence down here, just mention my name, and they'll tell you about tags. I am a jerk uh, when it comes to this. So when you come into the game, you, you come in on an alarm. We don't take anybody that's not with a company. If you're ahead of your company, you stand over there until someone from your company absorbs you and then gets into the manpower bin because we actually run a manpower bullpen. When, when whoever it is, when they come in to check in, they don't come to me. They go to the guy that's running the manpower who I give a direction to as to where to go and what to do. So they go check in. We have a very aggressive – we actually have three levels of tags. So we actually, as a result of Eddie Ramos – and he had a tag. The problem is he left it on a, on the dashboard of his car. So we have the essentially that concept where it's the pickup tag. So it gets hooked onto the truck. And then at the end of the day, or at the end of the call, if there's a tag left, we have a problem. I, that's not, the, that's the, we call it passive tagging. I call it dead guy tagging, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's somebody's not back and we have to go figure it out. The second one we have is we actually have a, we have fledged accountability officers. Um, matter of fact, that's what I do for my after I retired. I went back to my hometown, and I'm the accountability and safety guy at jobs, and because I'm a jerk, and so they know that if you want to get in the game, you better walk up with a chain full of tags. If you don't have a chain full of tags, you're not getting in the game. You got to send somebody back to the truck, get the tags, and come up, or we'll make tags for you. You're not getting into the game with a t- without a tag. I can't do that. And then I have a person, and we have all these bo- all these setups where you tag in. The guy writes down where you're doing, what you're doing, and where you're going. And when you come out, you got to go back to him and say, "I'm out and over in staging." 
we actually developed a really good, it wasn't me, uh, the chief of Norwich, Ken Scandriato, did a, did a great job of developing a flow chart where you literally draw lines with that company as they come in and out of whatever the assignment is. And we use that and we use it aggressively. Uh, be, and, and that goes to that, you know, the agreement we made as chiefs is if I'm sending a cover company, I'm not even going to the call. My guys aren't even going to the call, but I'm moving a piece of apparatus. I'm getting up, I'm getting dressed, and I'm going to the command post. And I'm going to help that chief out. We, we run command as a team, almost like Bruno did with the senior, you know, senior advisors, similar. But I have guys just because of how it, we've learned over years that they're going to show up at this amount at this time. Matter of fact, we tried to use Billy G's, we tried to use Billy G's system, um, but we didn't need to be that flexible. We just because the same guy showed up or their department showed up at the same time. So we have guys that always do safety. We have guys that always do water supply. We have guys that always do the rapid intervention uh, team or a group. I really appreciate that because most people don't think about that. And rapid intervention is not rapid. Um, so we have people that do that stuff all the time. But one of those guys is the accountability guy. And if God help you, God help you, if I find you inside and we don't know you're in there, number one, you're never going to play on my fire ground again. I don't care who you come with. And then number two, we're going to have a conversation with your boss. Because all the bosses signed on to this and said, nope, we're going to tag them. This is what we're going to do. We're going to tag them. This is what we're going to do. So if I have someone who's breaking the agreement, essentially the trust that I have that they're going to take care of their people, and they, they break that trust with me, then we're going to have a conversation. And we're going to say, listen, you, can't, you just can't be doing that. We need to know everybody. I, I spend a lot of time. With, I was one of the chief to chief folks for the National Fire and Firefighters Foundation. A good friend of us, Bobby, Danny Krasinski, spent a lot of time with Danny. Uh, and and if you talk about duty nights, he does. He runs a great duty night down in, uh, in, in East Franklin, New Jersey. Uh, and I, I, I dealt with, I've dealt with a lot of chief officers that have lost guys. And so this is very, I'm very passionate about this. So I don't care if you like it. I don't care if you don't ever come back to my fire again. That's, that's on you. But if you come into this, when you, if you came into the city, you tagged in. Again, I have one guy that was just really good about, he just balanced the people. He, I'd say, I need, a, I need a team to go do this. Boom, done, boom, done. It just worked for us. Now it doesn't work for everybody, but it worked for us. And like I said, we're, we're hard about it. I was a real jerk about it. And so there's two things that Nick has said here, and I just want to dovetail just really quickly before Sam and Frank jump in. Um, this, this is really important. I remember when Precious Faith Tabernacle Fire happened. I think it was like 95, maybe 93. But, but remember in Texas, the Precious Faith Tabernacle Fire happened down in Texas outside of, outside of Fort Worth. Um, anyway, um, a young firefighter pe perished there and they were unaware of the fact he was there until they located his body. The, the Fort Worth guys found his body and it wasn't due to anybody's negligence. It wasn't due to bad firefighting. It wasn't due to, it just happens. No one imagines losing someone. No, no one. And, and, and he'd actually arrived and, and rode in on the engine and, and um, it was heartbreaking and, and, and they're some of the best firefighters you're ever going to want to meet those guys. They, they were, they, they, they just are. And, and, and uh, wonderful people. So to Sam's, to Nick's point, accountability isn't just about the tags. And now we're moving into these electronic systems where your phone will log you in and, and, and other systems like that. And I get it, which are great and necessary, but what's even more great and even more necessary is that, that human connection and maintaining it and then backing up your electronic system with a physical system, with a human system and, and, and you know, accountability to, to put it quite frankly, and I can't remember exactly who to credit with this is, is not just being on a tag ring and not just being in an electronic system, but me being able to reach out and grab your happy ass as a supervisor at some point in time, that's accountability. That, that that's crew integrity. Absent that, you got squat, and and you called them you know death tags or whatever. I mean you know knowing, but so those systems are so critical. In in Europe, they have the SCBA guy who or gal who 
checks your air as you're going in. And, and maybe someday we'll get to that point too as well. And I think a lot of electronic systems can do that for us. But, and, 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 I'm, and, and to my second point, and, and I'll, I'll let that go because you guys were very eloquent about the whole deal. To my second point about what Nick said, if you're joining the fire service to be popular or loved, you're, you're joining the wrong organization. <laughs> I would rather have a thousand Nicks working with me or a hundred Nicks working with me than, than Mr. Lovey Dovey or Mr. or Mrs. Lovey Dovey. I, 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 I want people who care more about the work and the responsibility of the work and the accountability of the work than their popularity. Um, it's not a popularity contest, you know, and, and, and I want, I want hard, strong, tough people. That's what I want. And I want to keep them hard and I want to keep them strong and I want to keep them tough by having systems like mental health and support groups and all the other good stuff that we have. That's what keeps us hard. That's what keeps us strong. That's what keeps us tough. And, and while I was making an excuse to use the restroom by saying I was getting another cup of coffee, which I did, but I had to use the restroom first, the tough gal who came walking in here, that 67 year old, uh, beautiful woman of mine, just got home from having cancer surgery on her leg. She's not even supposed to be walking. She's got a 14 inch incision down her, God. that ain't keeping her in bed. You know, <laughs> she's tough and she's strong, but she's probably the most compassionate person you'd ever want to meet. It, but you screw with her, like on the fire ground, you, you, you fail to put your rings on, and, and the conversation she's going to have with you will involve a boot up your ass so far that, that you'll be tasting Shinola for the rest of the week. And, and, and you know, and Nick, don't make no apologies for being tough and strong. Uh, people should apologize for being weak and, 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 and I don't mean weak in a, we're all vulnerable. I, mean, I don't mean weak in, in, in being vulnerable and being open and being caring. I, I mean, being more worried about being popular than being professional more worried about being light than, than, than doing the right thing to take care of the first, the folks who called us, and second, the men and women were responsible for taking care of our firefighters. You know, and, and to, we're, we're, we're going down a rabbit hole with this popularity stuff that I just, uh, makes my head explode. If I could just add one more thing. Listen, I'm part of a very special club that nobody wants to be in. I lost the guy. In fact, he died on me twice. The first time, luckily, he, if you're going to drop dead, you land on top of a bunch of firemen's feet. That's the place to do it. We resuscitated him, brought him back. He actually was my first accountability guy. He was the patriot of one of the companies. He was a pit bull, and so he was tough. So I'm I'm part of a t I'm part of a group that I never asked to be part of, and as a result of that, I'm not doing that again. Not if I can do it. Not if I can help it. I'm, I'm not doing that again. I, I'm just not. So if I have to, if we have to spend more money to get better gear, if we need all the bailout systems, so we, all those things. Matter of fact, when I come back from the show, they'd be all nervous because I was going to start another program <laughs> of, of, of something like that. We we're going to spend more money on some new gizmo that the boss saw while he was at the FDIC or the I chiefs or, you know, whatever, whatever it was. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm monopolizing. <laughs> no, you're not. This is a conversation. Man. Yeah. This is a good conversation. You know, and, 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 you know, if you look at Montgomery County, how, how many folks work in that system? Uh, 1,400, I think 1,200 some uniformed on the floor. And then, yeah. There's no way you're going to know who everybody is. There's just yeah. no way. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, that, that's, that's a big organization, 1,400 people. And then you get into people like FDNY where you're talking 14,000. You know what I mean? The guys go to jobs. They, they meet somebody in New York city. They'll never meet the guy again or gal, you know, they, they, you know, they, they, they do a rotation. They, well, one of the, you know, we, one of the things that we did talk about, and it goes back to the Montgomery County. So one of the things that we did do when we bought, built the cards, we're only so many, so much resources in such a space. So we had folks that had 15 minute, 20 minute response times in on the upper alarms. So we did what, again, we saw from New York is we relocated them. So if you were first due on the third alarm, you moved to a station on the second alarm. And then we had a company that was at the state that the second alarm that was just a, a, 
unbelievable EMS company, really strapped in, knew what they were doing and knew the turf. So we gave them that job for the whole time. So that company relocated on the first alarm and they stayed there. And they were the tour guide and the communicator for everybody else. And they covered, you know, 65% of what we did, which was the medical. So, so that relocation concept, um, again, I'm sure they do it. They have the authority to do that. We're going to move you closer because you might be the next whatever it is in. Yeah, or you're just filling in for those busy areas. We have a um, our our communication center has a piece of technology called uh, Live Mum Live Move Up Monitor, and it it monitors the actions of all of our units, and it gives you a uh, a suggestion, and it's dynamic. So any it's an at a glance thing. So you don't have to hit enter or hit load or hit. I need to know, you know. Uh, for this box alarm it's yeah, it's, it's always little, moving yeah. and uh it's pretty neat um pretty neat technology it kind of keeps you on your on your it allows you to do it quicker because the way it used to be done it was just hey well i know 26 is always in quarters i'm going to move them or i know this company's always here i'm going to move them they're centrally located now it's based on time yeah, uh, you know, time and distance, and, and you know, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm I'm not a luddite. I'm not opposed to technology at all. I think it's wonderful, but I think we have to be very careful about becoming like overly dependent on some electronic system, you know, to to the detriment of you know not having a good, you know, right. one of my favorite movies is the old um, what was it, um, you know, um, uh, the Mister Rogers character, uh, the, the Apollo thirteen movie with uh, yeah yeah uh, yeah yeah yeah. yeah when the guy takes all the computers and throws them off the table and takes out a piece of paper and here's the moon, here's the earth. You know, he draws the, he draws the line and you're like, if you can't do that, then your system's broken. You know what I mean? Well, so let's, let's talk about accountability from uh, crew integrity. Again, this is now, this is the wild card. This is the, this is the thing they used to keep me up at night or I would be on, I'd be like kind of wrapped tight around the axle about so on any, so let's, so we have four guys going in. It's a fire. The evolution was the, and the shift commander is driving the first two engine. I mean, it, it doesn't, you know, it's, it's not the best of uh, choice decisions, but it is what it is. So again, mission, get one line in place. Well, the ladder truck guy, he's going to set the ladder what's, where it's going to be needed in like 20 minutes. He's going to get on the line. He's going to help take the door. He's going to be the second guy on that line going in. Now, with the advent of the uh, backup team and with the uh, with the plus group, it gave us a little bit more flexibility. But in the early days, we didn't have that. So you've got some number of guys on that first line, you know. And when when maydays happen, they happen all over the building. It's not just like one little area. When you know when the Father's Day uh, explosion happened, it it blew up the building. I mean, it's not just one little tiny space. So that was always one of my big concerns. So we, again, we were very hawkish about that needing to know, cause we've had a couple of times where, we're, where we just didn't get to the seat of the fire and we had to transition back out worst nights of my life. And I, I would not let them turn on the tower until I personally saw you talk about the face to face, Bobby, until I personally saw the guy that I knew was on that nozzle. We were not opening that line. I didn't care what anybody told me. I didn't care what the, the, the division boss said. I didn't care. I needed to see the guy that was on that team and make sure. And then and when he told me that the other two were out, then I told him, go ahead, put it out. Because again, I'm not going to, you know, we're not going to do that. We're not going to rain fire and hell down on someone who's in there just trying to do their job and, and make the right decisions. So we were very, we were just very passionate, uh, passionate about that. And, and when we built in the system, so that, again, to go to the end of the article, as Bobby mentioned before, we easily met 1910. We easily met 1910 in, within the eight minutes I was there. We had all those people, and some of those people had to travel a little bit of distance to get there. Um, but we had, and we had all those jobs. You know, I, I was very lucky. Um, I got to spend some time out in Phoenix, and I got to sp sit in the battalion car in the simulator. And to listen to those guys, you know, beating on the, the, the door on the, on the computer, right, is to, you know, you know to uh, see it work. And again, Colchester, I got to give them credit. I actually mentioned their name in the, this was a group where they did it for, they did a bunch of training nights and they said, all right, how, many, how long is it going to take to do this and how many people? They came up with 
and they've got it all written out. They came out with 22 people in their system. They need 22 people to really, and that's putting, but that's putting three and four people on the line and all that. But they came up with 22 people. There's what in their rural, because don't forget, there's a whole rural application there where there's a water, there's a dump tank and tankers and a, a, a designated engine for drafting and all that. So that added more beef to their operation. But that's how they did it. They just trained on it. They took all the times and they said, that's too long for us to get this. We got to do it in this time. And that's what they wrote their strategic plan on. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. It, it no, just doesn't. And I think that in your article, you do a really good job of letting folks know that, you know, and the NFPA is an incredibly wonderful organization. The standards are phenomenal. But the, the problem for a lot of us is that our worldview is predicated on where we live, right? Exactly. What we're used to. So if you're a Connecticut guy, a Boston guy, a Montgomery County fella, or LA fella, or, you, you know, you see the world kind of differently, Philadelphia gal, you see the world kind of differently than, than somebody in Laramie, Wyoming, or, or, or 100 miles outside of Sioux Falls. You know what I mean? And so, and, and I'm not disrespecting it. I, I, I'm, I'm one of those people that likes those, I want to, I live in an area like that. I like, I like the country. I like rural America. I, I prefer it to the city. But I also understand that I'm not getting, you know, I'm not getting the a and brass band at every fire we go to. I'm getting <laughs> who's there. You know what I mean? And, and so your article was wonderful in saying, let's first understand what the potential risks are. Then let's look at what resources are out there. And then let's get what systems we can harden to ensure the safety and survivability of everybody who shows up. Everybody irrespective of their capabilities. Cause you mentioned a couple of uh, departments where they had a, I think you said a 72 and a 75 year old. Yeah. Guy. yeah. They, they were fine until he had a stroke. They were actually over in Italy and uh, they were spry. I had a kick out of them. Uh, they, I said, so I said that uh, Sam would get a kick out of this talking about codes. So I said, well, how many people do you get, have right on the ambulance? Well, we always try for three. I said, Oh, you're going to do the new, you know, the, the new uh, uh, pit stop CPR. And they both looked at me and go, no, we got to get the guy in the back of the ambulance because <laughs> they were like this big. Uh, but they were, I mean, they, they were it. And they did really good until they went away on vacation. And he actually had a stroke over in Italy. And then when, he, when they came back, he was definitely out, but he couldn't, he couldn't be left alone. You know, and, and, you know. I like to consider myself spry. That would be <laughs> Cause I'm, close, I'm closer to their age than yours, Nick. So that's it. <laughs> these two were, they did really good. I tell you, we, some of these are, that's the problem with trying to answer a lot of, you know, everybody's needs. I've had, I've had students at the Academy where, you know, they're from somewhere's on Colorado or Montana or Kansas or Wyoming. It doesn't matter. And they're in this 700 square mile County, right? And they've got like three stations. That's a big job. And, it, and, and, and to not to pick on NFPA, but if you're in 1720, right? And I think if you're considered rural, you, got, you have to have six people there in like 14 minutes or something. It, listen, if you start a barn on fire and it takes you 14 minutes to get there, you could have, you're going you're to need more than six or you're not going to need any because you're, you'll be just wetting out the grass, right? It, it'll be a brush fire. So that's the tough part. That's why it, it's so hard to try to build a system. And that's why, you know, again, they talk about engineering. In, in Connecticut, we just can't get our heads wrapped around residential sprinklers. So I am in a farmhouse and I'm 10 minutes from the station. I get two 275s in the basement, a little pump. We'll figure it out, we're farmers. We don't throw anything away. We just keep fixing it, right? So we hook this thing up. We may say, we, let's say we get one that the fire marshal will approve if there is a fire marshal. And we have a kitchen fire or we have a bedroom fire. And it's going to take 10 minutes for the boys to get, the girls to get there. Guess what? 10 minutes worth of water. Maybe you make it bigger. Now, instead of there being nothing, the main house is going and the barn's next. Now, maybe it is just a can job or a, a one-line job. You know? Well, you know, it's funny you should say stuff. I used to live in a ranching community. I used to live outside of the King Ranch. Oh my and God. the King Ranch was 700 miles. Yeah. Just that ranch. Yeah. Just one ranch. So when, when you start talking about something, I'm like, yeah, okay, I get it. But, 
but it's a different kind of folk that live out there. My wife and I have relocated to, to about 30 miles north of Tulsa, Oklahoma, to, which is, we consider that the, the inner city because um, folks here got running water and such. So, uh, but, but when we have one of those fires, Nick, we call them y'all come fires. You know, yeah. Y'all come. Yeah. So it's a, it's a different deal. But this has been a wonderful conversation. And I think that what's nice about it is that, and I hope folks reach out to you, Nick and, and, and Sam, and, um, and I know Frank can put you in touch with just about anybody, but you did a great job on that article. And Sam's always got great insights into, you know, you do, man. You're, Thank you. you're a phenomenal, the chief. <laughs> you're a phenomenal guy. Both of you are, you're phenomenal guys. And, and you know, the, just the points that Nick has in that article about the leadership stuff alone, is worth reading because you know it's gritty and it's real and it, you know, you. It, it, it's not and it's coming from a guy who as as nick has said lost a friend and a fellow firefighter at a fire you know someone who should have walked out alive did not and so you don't want to ever know what he knows and and when you understand that that's his worldview all that grittiness makes a lot of sense because it's not, you know, he's, he's not pretending to care. He, he really cares. And, and it came through in the article. I mean, it, well, it, thank it's, you. It, it, it's just a that. wonderful thing. And, and uh, I can't, can't thank you enough for doing it. And so it was really wonderful. So I know Frank has been having internet <laughs> issues and we apologize. Um, out here in rural Oklahoma, we apparently have stronger internet than the, <laughs> The inner city of New Haven, I'm, Connecticut. I've never had these issues before, so this is uh, surprising, but we're at the witching hour. I want to thank Nick. Frank, that, that happens yeah. to all of us. I mean, you don't have to explain it to me. We are, there's, a, there's, there's all kinds of products that you can buy on, online now. And comes <laughs> on. I can't stay on long enough to get them, though. That's the problem. So, but I want to thank oh Sam, Bobby, Nick from coming on today. But there, a story came across on Firefighter Nation today that I just want to quickly mention because it's such a great story about being small. And we talked a little bit about accountability today. So in Union Township, Pennsylvania, a volunteer was going to a landscaping job. He saw some smoke, checked it out. When he got there, somebody said there's a kid, a 12 year old trying to break out the window on the second floor. And lo and behold, he called dispatch to update, dispatch to say that there was a kid hanging out on the second floor. And the dispatcher had the wherewithal to say, there's a barn on the property. Maybe you can get a ladder in the barn. He got the ladder from the barn and made the grab and still kept in contact with dispatch. So they knew he was operating on scene and saved the girl. So you can be so, a small and you can be So that's really so, that's wonderful, Frank. And I read that article this morning. Thank you for bringing that up. But to Nick's point, when you're, and, and Sam's point, when you're doing your community risk assessment, you learn things like that. Like, hey, there's a painting company two blocks away. They've got ladders. You know, mm -hmm. hey, there's a, you know what I mean? Th th in other words, it's not just looking at the threats. It's looking at the, the opportunities and, and the assets. And, and uh, you know, I can't, you know, a good friend of mine used to run Montgomery County Fire and still a dear friend of mine. He's now living in Hawaii. And uh, used to give him such a hard time. He wasn't a firefighter, by the way, also. He was uh, in the trucking industry and, and was made the, uh, uh, I don't, it was called like the director or something, Sam. You have like a director or something? Yeah, that was, so that was the, yeah. We used to have a, a director of, of, uh, of, of fire rescue and then it transitioned uh, in the mid-90s to a chief. Right, and this, and this was before um, the chief from uh, Charleston. It was just before the, uh, before. Uh, or Tommy. It was, uh, Tommy. It was, uh, uh, was it Granadas? No, no, no. Uh, 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 um, he was he was Japanese and, and from Hawaii. Um, and oh, just, um, oh, God, hold on. I'll uh, I'll think of it here. Um, wonderful guy, Gordon Aoyagi. Gordon, Gordon, uh, <laughs> Gordon Aoyagi. Sorry, yeah. Gordon Aoyagi. Oh, Gordon a Aoyagi. great, great guy. Excellent. Super guy. But Gordon understood logistics and asset management yeah. like nobody else. And, and, and Montgomery County is huge. I mean, it's, it's huge and it's complex and, and, and it's a monster. And Gordon did a great job. Gordon 
Gordon was not a firefighter. He'd be the first guy to tell you he didn't, he didn't tinker on the, on the edges like that, but he knew how to organize and, and, uh, and, and, and still a lot of what he established for you guys, you still use. And oh, absolutely. And he loved the job. He loved, he loved the uh, firefighters and he loved the job. And, um, the, you know, he was definitely, obviously that, that, that paid dividends with, uh, with and, the buy and with the troops. He, but, he, uh, he actually yeah. was a member of Baggers with us. And uh, <laughs> back when Baggers was very small. And, and, and he was the brunt of thousands of relentless jokes from some really cruel guy. Uh, <laughs> a really cruel guy. Because it was, you know, during the whole um, wax on, wax off thing movie was playing Karate Kid. And the guy had the same name. So I used to just give him so much grief. And, and he loved it. Because it, it made him feel like, you know, if we don't mess with you, we don't like you. Right, you know I mean? right. That's like rule number one. And, and so <laughs> anyway, Frank, I'm sorry we went a little over. I know you've got, got to go out and, 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 and trash some Democrats or something, whatever you do for a living now. <laughs> well, well, I do apologize to our listeners because we said that we would talk a little bit about the IFF and because of connection issues. So the next show, we're going to do a little bit more focus. We will reissue our invite again to Eddie Kelly and uh, – Harold Shakespeare, and I think it is something that needs to be explored a little bit more. And I have some new information that's quite disturbing, but uh, everybody gets equal air on fire engineering. So we will uh, see if they come on. And uh, thank you very much, Nick. Great article. I'll tweet it out when I leave work tonight. Thank and uh, Bobby thank Hall, and it's always an honor to have you. And Sam, it's great to see you. And uh, you all take care today. Thank you, Frank. Thank Thanks. you, guys. God bless. Thanks, Bobby. Love you, fellas. Thanks, Sam. Love you. Thanks. <laughs>